Two and a Half Admins, episode 158. I'm Joe. I'm Jim. And I'm Alan. And here we are again. Let's do some news then. Dropbox limits all the storage you need unlimited plan and blames abusive users. Well, that's a story we have never before heard in the history of computing and free unlimited blah, blah, whatever. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> tale as old as time. It's not just storage companies like Dropbox. It's not just cell phone providers. It's not just, yeah, <laughs> I mean, you name it. it. Any kind of service plan I can think of from any kind of company I can think of that has an unlimited plan, said company has eventually said, well, actually, <laughs> about that word unlimited, there are limits. Yeah, as we've said before, it's much more honest when a company just says, after this much, it costs X per Y. And that's honestly usually what I look for because otherwise they're either losing money or trying to trick you or, or just going to pull the rug out from under you later. I can imagine if you're a big media production company and you're using a whole lot of Dropbox storage to move video files around, this might have really jumped up and bit you pretty badly. Just to play devil's advocate for a moment, even if you want to take the most charitable possible view of the ways that these keep happening and you know take the part of the companies do it, you can certainly make a case that the unlimited plan without a specified upper boundary, like it serves a purpose in the earlier days of a popular service because it basically it's a way of saying we have excess capacity and we don't mind you using it as long as we have excess capacity. But eventually there will no longer be excess capacity and limits will have to be imposed. And so from this point, you know, we haven't ascribed any kind of malice or even, you know, lack of care whatsoever to the company with the quote unlimited unquote plan, right? But from the user's perspective, it's still dangerous to take advantage of that because what's really happening is you don't know what the upper boundaries actually are going to be when they run out of excess capacity. So maybe the terabyte of storage that you're using at some online service with a free unlimited whatever, maybe that will be under what their actual goal of limits per user will be once they no longer have excess capacity that they're willing to just let go. Or maybe it will be way above and beyond and you have no way of knowing until they actually start imposing the limits. So if you bank on being able to do just about anything on any of those services, not just like hoard absolute, you know, amazing amounts of whatever and use hundreds of times as much as another person, not even going that far. You really just can't afford to come to depend on those services because until those limits come down, you don't know where they're going to be. And you might be fine or you might be screwed and you don't want to find that out on something mission critical when it happens. Yeah. And we talked about when Google did this with not even the amount of storage, but the number of items in the storage and people who had more items than that found we can't upload anything new until we delete 100,000 items. And they're like, we're a university. We don't know what's safe to delete. But you've just broken the entire university until we sort this out. And like Jim was saying, if you're depending on your usage being acceptable rather than unacceptable, then the problem can be also if you're talking about 15 plus terabytes, uploading that somewhere else, just moving the data to somewhere else could take months it's interesting that one of the reasons they're citing is people taking the piss with chair mining. Yeah, but also they said they saw a big influx of people moving large amounts of data in when other storage providers started having a cap. So when Google introduced their cap and, and I think a bunch of the other similar services to Dropbox and the current point in the economic cycle means these companies are trying to show that they can make money at this, not just continue to give away storage for below cost forever to try to get a user count. And when all those things come together, it turns out somebody has to pay the bill for the storage. And if you're not paying X dollars per gigabyte per month for your storage, somebody is. When you said the thing about, you know, the influx of users, when a similar service imposes limits and, you know, the flood comes in, it just gave me really unpleasant flashbacks. In my early 20s, I lived in an absolutely terrible apartment complex that, frankly, should have been torn down decades earlier. And uh, the walls were just Swiss cheese in those places. There was no way you could not have a roach problem. All you could really do was pick the degree of roach problem that you had. And one of the interesting periodic features of living in a place like that is, you know, you get a set of, of new neighbors or just a neighbor who periodically decides whatever and goes out and just gets 
these insane like roach bombs and just blankets their apartment in it and sets them all off and leaves. And what happens is all of a sudden your apartment is flooded with their roaches. <laughs> <laughs> Not to call the lovely, lovely users of unlimited file storage services roaches or anything. But, you know, the biggest problem with any service like this is, you know, they're like, it's unloaded within an acceptable use policy. But it says, you know, another reason that Dropbox decided that defining acceptable and unacceptable use cases for many customers was not sustainable is they end up having to un end the unlimited plans. Yeah, how many caveats can you throw in, ultimately? Because people were taking the piss also with reselling the space as well. Yes, that one's funny, is the <laughs> being able to get your Dropbox unlimited for this price and then sell people per gigabyte out of it. <laughs> this is where I regret we're in an audio-only format because I'm just dying to flash up the, it's free real estate. <laughs> <laughs> Intel doesn't plan to support Wi-Fi 7 on Windows 10. Which ultimately is really not that big of a deal. Out in the wild, I really don't see a whole lot of people even on Wi-Fi 6 yet, much less 6E, and 7 still just looks like a pipe dream. Also, if you've looked at the specs for Wi-Fi 7, I'm having trouble getting too excited about it because the majority of the changes that they're making come in terms of making it possible for a single device to consume a lot more spectrum. And the major problem that most people have with Wi-Fi, whether they realize it or not already, is one device hogging up all the spectrum and leaving no airtime available for any of the others and therefore massive latency spikes when you've got a busy Wi-Fi network, which everybody does. I don't think there's anybody left in the United States of America that has a single Wi-Fi device. That's not true. I don't think there's anybody with a home in America who has a single Wi-Fi device. I don't know any 12-year-old kids that only have a single Wi-Fi device at this point. There are a couple of improvements in Wi-Fi 7 that, in theory, look like they could address the real issues that, that people experience, you know, in, in terms of overuse of spectrum and airtime availability. There is a feature that allows uh, more seamless shifting from one band or channel to another from both client device and router alike. And in theory, that could be quite helpful. But in practice, it just reminds me of an entire laundry list of features in Wi-Fi 6 that were supposed to make all this stuff better, that were supposed to make it a lot easier to intelligently share out the spectrum so that every single device in your house didn't have to shut up <laughs> while another one talked. But in practice, it's been years and none of those features actually work right yet. So it's going to be fine, folks. If you don't have Wi-Fi 7 on your Windows 10, it will not <laughs> cause you any problems. I promise. Yeah, you're not going to buy any new devices that come pre-installed with Wi-Fi 7 cards running Windows 10. Yes, that's the big thing here is basically what Intel is saying is when we release the new devices that support Wi-Fi 7, we're only going to make drivers for Windows and Linux and Chrome OS. And for Windows, we're only going to do it for the version that's going to ship on those devices. It's really hardly news. It's like I'm sure Intel didn't support newer Wi-Fi and older versions of Windows in the past as well, right? Like when Windows 7 was out, they didn't offer Windows XP drivers for even the N wireless or whatever it would have been at the time. To be fair, Windows XP was actually obsolete and deprecated at that point, and 10 has not achieved that yet. 10 is still supported for now. Yes. So I can see people being a little anxious about it. It's just in practice, like I said, this is not something anybody's going to miss. It, it will be fine. Yeah. And they're saying that Windows 10's 22H2 is the last release of Windows 10, and the official EOL of Windows 10 will be October of 2025. So it's already not going to be getting any new features. Of course, we've known that for a while. Yeah, but presumably, Jim, you support quite a lot of desktop users, and presumably a lot of those are still Windows 10 rather than 11. Yes, and absolutely none of them need Wi-Fi 7. Yeah, that's the real issue here. It's just this is not like a critical technology that you can't possibly miss out on. This is not a revolutionary new like 3D gaming card that's going to make 4K gaming incredible on old machines. Or I, I, I'm having trouble even coming up with a comparison to like where it would make sense to get like super concerned about this. What they're saying is that, you know, this operating system that the last version of it has ever been released and the successor has been being sold 
for more than a year now. Well, in a year or two, when you maybe start seeing new devices of this new technology, we're not going to make drivers available for the old thing that will have been, you know, several years done with by that point. It just, it, in no way is this a big deal. It's not a big deal given the the ages, you know, of the operating systems in question and the availability of operating systems in question. It's not a big deal, you know, based on the likelihood that people will genuinely need Wi-Fi 7 devices. Also keep in mind, we're talking about day one that the Wi-Fi 7 stuff launches. If you're talking about like two or three years after Wi-Fi 7 drops, well, at that point, your Windows 10 is going to have been done and gone with for like six or seven years. So this is just not worth getting worked up about. There are certainly some specialty use cases where you might need a tremendous amount of bandwidth from a single device connected to a single router with all of the airtime and all of the spectrum available, and you need to suck down all of it. And in that case, you know, you can either use one of the earlier 60 gigahertz protocols or you can put Windows 11 on that machine or God forbid, just jump off the Microsoft train and go Linux or BSD. Yeah, BSD won't have drivers for about 10 years, though, will they? Well, we port the Linux one, so <laughs> it won't be that bad. Fair enough. Because it's Intel. If it was a Broadcom chip, you'd be right up the river. Let's do some feedback then. Matthias says, just heard someone wanted IPMI for Raspberry Pi. Is this it? And then links to Turing Pi. Yeah, and that Turing Pi 2 is absolutely the answer. If you want BMC or IPMI for a small cluster of Raspberry Pi or similar single board computer devices, this is your answer. For 260 bucks, you get a board with uh, two NICs and four bays that will accommodate single board devices that use NVIDIA Edison compatible pins. And they have available Raspberry Pi devices, Edison devices, and also some pretty interesting rock chip devices that are in some ways a little bit more powerful even than the uh, than the Edison's. So you can slap four single board computers into there. You get BMC IPMI functionality for all four of them, as well as interconnects for them. So if you if your idea is like, I want a cluster of cheap, low power devices for my home lab, this looks like the answer to your question. The only thing is, though, that it won't work with existing Raspberry Pis. You need to have the compute module form factor to work with this. Yeah, but you get quite a bit more with it. You get two mini PCIe Express slots, two actual SATA ports, four M2 slots. It's quite a nice rig if if you were building something specifically to do this. So just to be clear, you don't need to buy some kind of special Raspberry Pi-like module from these Turing Pi folks. The board is just designed to work with Raspberry Pi 4 compute modules, which is a separate product from the regular Raspberry Pi 4. So if you have existing consumer Pi 4s you wanted to use, this board won't work. But if you wanted to set something up new using the Pi ecosystem, you'd grab one of these boards and up to four Raspberry Pi compute modules. Even if you wanted to buy this completely from scratch, you're only looking at about 400 bucks, right, for four compute modules and the uh, Turing Pi. Correct, because the uh, the Turing Pi cluster board is 260 bucks. The Raspberry Pi compute module fours. Now, you may find different prices at different vendors. I'm looking at Canakit.com, which is just a generic Raspberry Pi vendor linked from the Pi Foundation's own homepage. They're 35 bucks a piece there. So for those, 140 bucks. Cluster board, 260. You spent 400 bucks plus whatever tax and shipping. Not really too bad for a small cluster for your home lab that is a, a whole lot nicer to work with than just, you know, a, a grab bag of standalone consumer pies with no infrastructure. Plus the ability to plug in a real hard drive. And have dual proper gigabit NICs. And high performance interconnects, not just on the network, <laughs> for your individual Raspberry Pi 4 compute modules, which is also pretty freaking sweet. I do want to make clear because I've been so enthusiastic about this thing. I'm enthusiastic about it as a very exciting looking device that if I wanted to build a low power cluster, I would buy to evaluate in a heartbeat. But I do want to make it clear because people listening to this show might not realize that it might sound like I'm just saying I've used this and it is great. That's not the case. If you do buy one of these things, we would love to hear your feedback on how the project turned out. Yeah, show at 2.5admins.com. Okay, this episode is sponsored by Collide. If you work in security or IT and your company has Okta, this message is for you. Have you noticed that for the past few years, the majority of data breaches and hacks you read about have something in common? 
its employees. Hackers absolutely love exploiting vulnerable employee devices and credentials, but it doesn't have to be this way. Imagine a world where only secure devices can access your cloud apps. In this world, phished credentials are useless to hackers, and you can manage every OS, even Linux, from a single dashboard. Best of all, you can get employees to fix their own device security issues without creating more work for IT. The good news is, you don't have to imagine this world. You can just start using Collide. Collide is a device trust solution for companies with Okta, and it ensures that if a device isn't trusted and secure, it can't log into your cloud apps. So support the show and visit collide.com slash 25A to watch a demo and see how it works. That's K-O-L-I-D-E dot com slash 25A. Let's do some free consulting then. But first, just a quick thank you to everyone who supports us with PayPal and Patreon. We really do appreciate that. If you want to join those people, you can go to 2.5admins.com slash support. And remember that for various amounts on Patreon, you can get an advert-free RSS feed of either just this show or all the shows in the Late Night Linux family. And if you want to send any questions for Jim and Alan or your feedback, you can email show at 2.5admins.com. Another perk of being a patron is you get to skip the queue, which is what Kevin has done. He writes, how should I manage my SSH keys? I've got a handful of servers that I admin and a handful of machines that I want to SSH into those servers from. I will add and remove servers because it's my home lab and I like to mess with stuff a lot. Every time I bring up a new server, I copy my SSH keys from GitHub using an Ansible playbook, which works decently well. But when I add a new client machine, I need to copy my pub key out to each server, which is more annoying than anything. I've seen guides on doing SSH certs instead of keys, and that seems like overkill for me, but maybe I should give that a try. Or maybe I should just set up a cron job on all my servers to auto pull down my SSH keys from GitHub. How do you all manage your SSH keys? There's a couple different approaches. The first one is kind of similar to what you recommended, is you can just have Ansible re-pull down from GitHub when you add a new key to GitHub, and then all the machines will have it. There's also a feature built into SSHD called Authorize Keys Command, which basically allows, instead of looking in an authorized key file, SSHD can run a command to see if the key is in the, the list of authorized keys. And you can use that to use LDAP or various other mechanisms to get the list of keys. So it could literally be a git cat of your upstream thing, although you don't necessarily want to have to connect to GitHub every time you try to SSH in to see if the key's there. But there are a bunch of interesting things you can do with that command in the SSHD config in order to more automate this process. But a cron job that just runs that Ansible playbook again to make sure that the right list of SSH keys is what's on each machine is probably the easiest way to do it. The other option is like you said, the SSH certs, because that allows you to basically have each machine trust a certificate authority that you create. And then you can give out as many client certificates as you want. And anyone that has one of those is able to SSH in and you don't have to constantly be updating the list of keys on each server. So if you have a very large number of servers or a very large number of users, certs can be a lot better. However, exercise caution with that approach because if you set up a CA and your machines will trust any cert issued by that CA if somebody owns that CA it can be very hard for you to figure that out because you're not watching it as closely it's just so easy to spin up a new one whenever you want and somebody else gets in there and manages to spin up one for themselves and then just start using it you may not notice and it may take you forever to figure out why unpleasant things are happening in your network so I, I would not recommend just blithely deciding to set up your own CA and, and do things that way when you've only got you know, a handful of machines or servers to manage. I will mention also, you know, if you're on the smaller scale, you may just not really need a whole lot of tooling for this. I tend to favor more of a stone axe approach myself. Some people will set up a single key and they'll put that key on several desktops and laptops, and that's just like their personal key. So it's like a per person key rather than a per device key. And in that case, any machine that has that key can get into all the servers that have that key and that simplifies things that way. I don't really like to do things that way. Whenever I set up a new laptop or a new desktop for myself, I will generate, you know, a, an individual key for that device. But um, I just don't have a whole lot of issue with this. You know, when I set up a brand new server and I want five or six different keys on it, 
I've actually just got a file that I can wget down from a web server that is the authorized key file that contains all of the keys for all of my machines. I just dump that into place onto a new box. No, no Ansible or anything. It's very stone X, but it's easy. It's predictable. It works every time. Yeah. In production, we use Puppet instead of Ansible. And so it runs every 30 minutes. And when a new user shows up and their SSH key gets added to the list, then it knows to add that person. We even use Puppet to do the other part, which is adding the known host entries for all the machines. So we never get the prompt of, oh, is this the machine you expect to be logging into? Because every one of our machines knows what the expected key is for every one of our other machines. And so when you try to SSH to it by its host name, it will have the known key. And you can also do, uh, publish those in DNS to, to do a similar thing. Although I think by default, SSH will only trust that if you have DNSSEC so that you can't get spoofed. It's probably also worth mentioning, it's it's easy sometimes to forget that the, the things that other people might not realize or know. If you're not aware, you can manipulate the authorized keys file directly and very easily. When I mentioned just w getting the authorized keys file down from a server, the keys that are allowed to log in as a particular user on a particular server are in that user's home directory in a hidden directory called .ssh. And it's literally just a file called authorized underscore keys. And it has all of the keys allowed to log in that machine, the pub keys, one per line. It's it's very simple. A lot of folks don't really know that that's there. They're just used to using ssh-copy-id command to move keys from one machine to the other. And obviously that works, but all that command does is just stick that extra line at the end of that simple text file in the remote user's .ssh directory. That's it. So it, like I said, if you want to manage things stone X, you can literally just have an authorized keys file and just copy it into place. It can be that simple if you would like it to be. There's also an interesting feature in, SS, in newer versions of SSH where when it logs that you're logged in, it will put which SSH key you logged in with as part of the log, which can help with tracking down how did this specific instance of a login get into my machine and knowing which key from the authorized keys file was the one that permitted the login. Magnus, who's a patron, also skipped the queue. He says, I run my Docker containers through a LexC on Proxmox. All data is stored in mount points for the LexC using bind mounts in Docker. The backup size is about 300 gigabytes, storage of pictures, documents, etc. It got me wondering, how do professionals handle data storage for containers? All in one solution with local mount points like me, or separated using NAS in a VM or a separate machine, Cloud S3, other solution? It can really depend on the use case. Some people like to treat their containers as disposable. And so any data that needs to persist, even if you throw away the container and stand up a new one, would be in a separate mount so that the container can go away, but the persistent data is separate. I personally like to make sure my data is broken into reasonable size chunks. So uh, when I have to replicate it or copy it, that I don't need necessarily a massive amount of space. 300 gigabytes is small for my use case, but if you're having to copy it over the internet on a slow uplink, then that might be large enough that you would want to split it up into smaller pieces. It really depends on your use case and if it makes sense to separate the pictures from the documents and so on. What everybody does is a bit different and it really highly depends on your use case. But if you're needing the data to be easier to back up and so on, having all your containers get their primary storage locally, just for the OS and the container itself, but have any persistent data mounted via a NAS or something, that can make it much easier to concentrate that data and be able to back it up and replicate it and store it safely without having to have all your storage be in your Proxmox. It really depends on your use case. It does. You know, that's that's one thing that I've been, honestly, been kind of just waiting for Alan to stop because I was itching to say it so badly. This really just comes down to your personal preferences in, in a lot of ways. When you mention how do professionals handle data storage? Well, is this a professional who prefers to silo storage and compute? Or is this a professional who prefers hyperconverged solutions like myself? There are a lot of folks who like to silo storage away from compute. So you have a computer with little or no local storage that is basically just a CPU and some RAM and a box that then runs you know, its operating system and any workloads from the storage on a NAS or a SAN on the local network. That's one way of doing things. Some people like to do it that way because you can think of the compute and the storage as separate things and manage them separately. 
I personally find, A, that's more expensive to set up that way. It tends to have some serious bottlenecks because now you have to have a really fast storage transport network or you've introduced some massive bottlenecks for a lot of workloads, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I like to run hyperconverged instead. You know, my boxes will all have a decent amount of CPU, RAM, and storage. And when I scale, I scale out with more boxes as opposed to just, you know, making a silo that's taller and taller and taller. There are arguments for different workloads as to which approach to take, but there's not ever really like one argument that says, even for a particular given workload, like this is the only way to do it. Now, given that you said that this is Proxmox that you're dealing with, that strongly implies that it's going to be ZFS under the hood, which gives you the option of ZFS replication for your backups. And if you've got all this stuff under ZFS data sets, whether they be file systems or ZVols, it's more likely to be ZVols into Proxmox. It's real easy to back that up to another ZFS system somewhere, which I'm guessing you're not doing because 300 gigs is, you know, seems like a problem to you. And uh, if you were using ZFS replication, I promise a 300 gig image would just feel like nothing. Yeah, like when I mentioned splitting things up, I, I usually think around the size of a hard drive at a time. So that's like 5 to 15 terabytes now, rather than 300 gigabytes. The one thing I will mention is, especially if you're doing something more like the app container type thing, I like to separate the data. So that's like a database, or like you said, the pictures and documents on a separate data set from the container itself. So that if there's a newer version of the application, I can just throw the container away, stand up a new one and connect the storage the documents and pictures back to the new version and not have to worry about the fact that they were, you know, the OS bits or the container bits and the content bits were mixed together. Yeah, I do that as well. Uh, most of my workload stuff is, is VMs. I don't actually mess with containers all that much. About the only time I really use containers is when an application that I want to use, like the supported deployment method is via container, in which case I do it the way they want to do it inside a VM typically. Because I like the extra separation the VMs offer. But along the same lines as what Alan was talking about, when I have a VM that is running an application that has like, you know, a pretty heavy, chunky, nasty to upgrade application and a lot of data, what I like to do is I like to have a separate virtual drive inside that VM for operating system and application and for data. That way, that means that if I have any kind of a problem, in addition to be able to do like Alan's approach and say, well, I can just throw away, you know, the application side of it, I want the data still there. I also have the option of handling, you know, like rollbacks and whatever on the ZFS level independently. There have been a lot of times that I have found myself grateful for the ability to roll back just the data while leaving, you know, the operating system and applications untouched or the other way around. Yeah, like I've, I've given entire talks at conferences about being able to undo and upgrade to your operating system without losing the newer version of this presentation in my home directory. Yeah, exactly. The, the home directory is is a really excellent example of that, you know, for any of you who are familiar with desktop Linux and like, you know, what it feels like using that, you know, imagine being able to just say, oh, well, I just want to undo this, you know, apt or yum or whatever update that went sideways on me and left everything all messed up. And yes, you have that ability to just snap your fingers and make it all go away. But now imagine the difference between being able to do that, only it also means your home directory goes back and you lose, you know, all of the things that you've created and downloaded and whatever versus that finger snap and your data is still exactly as it was at that time. Which one sounds better to you? Right, well, we better get out of here then. Remember, show at 2.5admins.com if you want to send any questions or your feedback. You can find me at joyrest.com slash mastodon. You can find me at jrs-s.net slash social. And I'm at Alan Jude on x.com. See you next week.